Where am I tonight? Play for over. Depends. Will your friend, the football, will be there? Oh, friend! Football friend! You're listening to Football Friends with Ben Garuccio and Stefan Mork. We have got a big one for you this week as the boys look back on Unite Round and Ben hitting the back of the net. We recap all the on-field action from the A-League men's and discuss what went right and what needs improving for the next edition of the concept. And Middlesbrough's new man between the sticks, Tommy Glover, joins us to chat about his time in the championship so far, the journey that got him there and everything, yes everything, in between. All that and more coming up on Football Friends. <laughs> Welcome back to episode 13 of the Football Friends with Ben and Steph. I'm Steph and here's Ben. Big smile on the face this week. No three points, but a cheeky goal. Yeah, yeah, it was good. It was good. Smile on the face. Got on the score sheet. I got my one for the season, so uh, <laughs> I'm off the nudie run at least. That's good. It's um, It's interesting, isn't it? I guess you've got the scorpion kick that you scored a couple seasons ago. And then this one, but they all count for the same, don't they? Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter yeah. what type of goal it is. Open goal, bicycle kick, scorpion kick, just counts for one. Exactly right. Now, I wouldn't mind scoring twenty of them a season. To be honest, it'd be good. Uh, probably earn a little bit more money, but now nah, it's good. It was good. It came to me quite quickly, so I just uh, just tried to not put it over the bar. To be honest, um, but it came nice and quick. I didn't have too much time to think about it and. Yeah, just finished it. There was no key green goal. So if I missed that, it would have been a bit embarrassing. I probably wouldn't be here today if I missed that. So, um, no, nah, it was good. It was good. It was a good game. I suppose um, we, we can just jump straight into the big Unite round review if you want. Yeah, Obviously, we let's were, kick it off. 3-3, we three, three, first up. Yeah, yeah, we were first cap off the rank. So, no, it was good. Um, it was a good game, to be honest. Like, great start to the round. There was, I think, 28 goals or something in the round. So, it was... Good games, good games all around. But um, no, nah, for ours, it was, look, it was a good performance. Um, again, obviously disappointed not to get all three points, but um, it, it was a good game. Like for the neutral, I think it would have been a top game to watch. And um, it was good, you know, to see Pena get on the score sheet. I think he probably had a few shots this season without without too many goals. So um, yeah, he got on the score sheet. The second goal probably was class. And then obviously... On the other side, we had the Villa, who was just um, carrying MacArthur, really. So hat trick, um, yeah, he, he's a. Did he's it go down player. as a goal for him? Not a, not a tra- own goal. I'm not sure. It would be harsh if it was an own goal off Freddy. I think it was pretty close to him. It looked like it was going on target. So I don't know. It'd be it'd be a harsh own goal um, if you're Traddy. But nah, it was just it was a crazy game to be honest. Um, we we had good control of the game. Uh, we probably lost it for a little bit after after they scored their goal, um, and then obviously we go down two one, which is which wasn't great. And then, but we just we look, we played well, we played well throughout, and and we created chances. And yeah, it was just a little bit different than other games gone by. We actually took those chances, and yeah, we had a we had a good opportunity to win the game, and that's the disappointing part. We just cop that goal, you know, you score in the eighty fifth minute, you you think you're going to win the game, and then you cop that goal. It's just disappointing. Yeah, I think it was, um, yeah, I actually missed the first 10 minutes. So I missed your, uh, just missed your goal. I, I forgot like what time the games were on because it's, it's obviously a bit of a yeah. weird time. And this is what we'll talk about afterwards um, with scheduling and everything like that. But yeah, it was, it was, it was a great game. Like, all, all games were really good. Like probably the most boring game was maybe like the Central Coast victory. I felt like there wasn't a lot of action, but every game, even the city West Sydney, like was good, like. Lots of goals. You guys, you know, you, you want your key players to stand up. And, and obviously, Pena is probably someone that's, you know, been brought in to be, be the main creative player to score goals, assist. And you know what it's like. Like, maybe you don't, to be honest, as a fullback. But, like, as a as an attacking player, when you go, like, a few games without scoring, like, the pressure just, like, mounts on you. You could play really good. And he started the season well. I think he scored a penalty, was it, earlier on. But, yeah. If you if you don't score, you go like one game, two games, three games, four games. Like all of a sudden, all you're thinking about is is is, is scoring goals, and it's the worst way to be. Like that's something that I really try and work hard on to not focus on the outcome. But I remember when I was at Melbourne City and I went like the first seven eight games and I came back on loan without scoring. 
and it's a fucking disaster. Like you actually start getting chances, you're snatching at it, your performance actually goes from being, you know, good overall to shit because all you're thinking about is scoring. So you're not even doing the basics right. And that kind of looks like what it's been like with him. But the you know, the first goal obviously, like, you know, you can't miss that. If you miss that, then he might as well just call it quits for the year and and just wait wait till next season. But the second goal, like, you know, like how how can you wait so long to score your first goal from open play? And then you score a second like that that type of finish as well, like to drag it back and bend it. Like it, it's unbelievable. But it's like, well, where was this all those other games? But it just goes to show you the confidence of scoring a goal, what it does for those attacking players, and hopefully, for Western United's sake and for your sake, that's just the start of of him really kicking yeah. off coming back from the ACL. Yeah, he's he's actually had he's had his moments. Like he's, he's such a good player, and the reason he's such a good player is because. He'll try things that don't come off, but he keeps on trying it the next time. Like he, it just looks like he never loses confidence. He never loses belief in himself. Um, and I think that's probably one of the best attributes you can have as a footballer because once you lose belief in yourself, you're doomed. You know, it's no one else is going to believe in you. It's hard enough to get people to believe in you in this sport um, at a professional level. But yeah, he, he's great like that. And lucky, look, he's had moments where, you know, just missed or hit the crossbar a couple of times. Um, I think like he's got the quality there. He can he can set up goals. He can score goals. But yeah, hopefully, hopefully he contributes with a few more this season. Yeah, exactly. And um, the Villa, like you said, on fire. He's him, Lolly. Those two have probably been, I reckon, your two two best players. Um, obviously, Fornaroli as well. Um, but like the Villa, is just yeah, he's he's a machine. He's he's one of those players that. You know, to score the amount of goals he's scoring as a number ten, the creativity, yeah, he is he's the one that makes that team tick. So if he keeps firing, then they'll they'll always be win, in with a chance to win games. Um and then we go on to the other Friday night game, the the double header, Melbourne City, West Sydney. Uh West Sydney got the three points. They they fielded a really young team. They've obviously got quite a few injuries at the moment. Rudin's kind of, you know, it seems like they've changed a little bit in the, their approach. They've obviously got these talented young players. They're now kind of blooding them through. And yeah, they were, they for me, they were the better team. There was that controversial handball incident right at the end, which I actually think could have been a handball, but was it an obvious error? Was it clear? Probably with the camera angles, maybe not. I don't know if you saw it straight after your game, but uh, you know, City probably didn't deserve it either from that game. So, like, it's a tough one. But I think Western Sydney would be very, very happy with that performance from especially a lot of the youngsters. I'm, I'm quite quite impressed with a, a few of those. Yeah, it was it was actually a top game, like very um, in the beginning, very end to end. I didn't actually see the end of the game, um, but I saw the, the early bits of the game and it was great game, like so, so end to end. But, um, yeah, top goal from, from Dil Prius. Um, he's got that in his locker, as we've said earlier episodes. You know, he's got that in his locker when he gets in the box. He's a good finisher. He can he can make something happen. But it was a great ball um, from Badalado. Um, such a good yeah. ball, you know, on the turn. There wasn't there wasn't much of an angle, and he's just as, no. as it's come across him, he's just slipped it through perfect way. Yeah. Um, like yeah, you you look over that, but that's such a hard thing to do when you're out there in that split second. So um, just giving yeah, him the no, eyes. It, yeah, given the eyes, little reverse ball. It's yeah, as I said, it looks a lot harder than, or it looks a lot easier than what it is. Um, but no, it it was a good game. Um, so many good games across the weekend. I didn't see the handball. I saw the handball for the first Western Sydney goal, which they brought that back from the halfway line. But they didn't want to bring it back in in the Western United game. So, um, yeah, it, it, it's funny. You know, I saw a few tweets this weekend about refereeing and things like that, and it pushes crowds away. Look. There's decisions in every game all across the world. You're never going to get everything right. Some things are wrong. I think across the season, it, it balances itself out. Um, you can't complain too much. You can't use things as an excuse. Yeah. I I don't think the referees are turning people away. You know, if you're turning, turn, like you're turning away from football because of the referees, then, well, what are you going to do? Not watch the Premier League because they complain probably more. Yeah. There's more scrutiny on those guys for their decisions um then in the a league they have talk shows 24 7 they have highlight shows they have everything there um it is what it is it's it's never going to be consistent that's just the reality of it that's why i think they should scrap 
um, VAR because it doesn't help the referees. It just puts more pressure on them and, and replays the incidents. But anyway, that's uh, enough referee talk. We don't want to talk about them too much. Um, uh, going into Central Coast, Melbourne victory. Um, looked like they had it in the bag, to be honest. Like they were dominating the game. It was, a comfort- it was actually like, not in a bad way. It was just a bit of a boring game. Like there wasn't really a whole lot of action. Very controlled from victory. Central Coast didn't really threaten. I didn't think too much from what I saw. Um, but then again, great ball through. Impact from your bench players. Score a goal. That's what you want, obviously, for your, your strikers to come on, make an impact, score a goal. And, you know, Central Coast are, are you know, still, still in great form. Their first game without Tulio, which was interesting to see. And victory undefeated still. Like, it's, it's what are we, 12 rounds in? to the season and they're undefeated like i know they've drawn a lot but fuck it's pretty good like they could be they could be on their way to be the invincibles invincibles yeah look i think they're still going to be disappointed with that one though i think that was two points dropped from them to be honest because um that was probably the worst i've seen central coast in a few weeks um since they've sort of turned around their form um just think they weren't probably just as fluid as they were in the games gone by Look, look that can be down to also Melbourne victory and, and the way that they set up against them. So you can't take things away from Melbourne victory. But yeah, just to cop a goal so late like that um, would be disappointing if you're a victory player. But no, but, uh, credit to, to Central Coast because they didn't give up. They, they stayed in the game. It was only one goal. When it gets like that in a tight game, you know, all you need is one moment late in the game. And um, the young Jing Rees, he, he took it well. So no, it was, a, it was yeah, probably one of the less entertaining games of the round but but still a good good quality game overall yeah no exactly and um yeah victory again i know that you said that they would be disappointed but it's like you know away from home technically um you know it's not bad it's not a point against central coast it's okay obviously missing bruno it'll be it'll be really interesting to see the window's been open for four days it's still very early but um, there is a lot of in the A League, which people hate. Fans love to say the mutual termination season um, kicks off as you know Bernardo's left uh, Adelaide United, but there hasn't been too much uh, too much movement. And um, besides that, there's there's a r- few rumours around with other players I know at Adelaide. Whether that stuff actually happens or not, I don't know around the rest of the league. But it's always interesting to see Melbourne Victory might go out and just get a striker. Um, just so they've got someone, but it's a big commitment, obviously, because then Bruno comes back, and if you you secured a a good player, um, then you're fighting, and, and do you want to unbalance the squad? So these are all the decisions, I guess, like you know that the the board and the managers will be making at the moment. So we'll see see what the teams do, because it's always always exciting, I think, um, you know, to see new players coming in and and seeing what they can do. But going on to the next game, and like. This was probably this and the the Wellington Perth game, both four yeah. three, like un unbelievable four three game. Adelaide started terribly, like it was yeah. like could have been two nil. Obviously, they've missed the sitter. Was it Fabio that's missed the sitter? You go two nil, game over. Adelaide are down on confidence. They haven't won in a while. They're home, but away from home at, at Allianz Stadium, and you probably put that down as three points for Sydney. They're kicking on. Instead. Big uh, Ibasuki up the other end produces the goods. You take your chances. Um, yeah. Obviously, the first one similar to the Garuch finish, open goal. Really, like it's not, it's not hard to score that one. But the second one was was great composure to cut back on the right, finish with your left as you're kind of falling backwards. He does it in slow motion because he's he's a big boy. <laughs> but you know, like it's good feet for like someone that's so big. Yeah. Um, and then the header was was world class. Like. You can't yeah. stop, like, all right, maybe if it's if the keeper read it a bit earlier. But to be honest, like, top cross from Clough, top finish, and they didn't have too many other chances than that. Nesta's goal, obviously, as well. They didn't have too many other... Clough maybe had one more chance, but Sydney had so many shots, couldn't score. Then they're 4-1 down, then it goes back into to 4-3, and you're thinking, shit, like, Adelaide are going to cop one, another one here and, and, and draw this game. But they, they held on. And that's all that matters at yeah. the end of the day. You um, you just won the three points, isn't it? Yeah. Oh, it was a, such a good game. Honestly, had everything. I thought, yeah, Sydney, the way they started, I was honestly thinking like they're going to be a very, very good team um, in the, in this second part of the season. And I still think they they will be because 
the way they press when they lose the ball, their reaction, how well everyone presses together makes it so hard for the other team to, to actually play because you don't have time to look up. You don't have time to get your head up because their front players, like they're, they all work really, really hard. Um, mm. But they kind of just lost their way in the game a little bit, I think, like after Adelaide did score a couple of goals and they go down and then things kind of just looked like they weren't. It was just looked like it was going to be one of those days for Sydney and they kind of lost their belief a little bit. It looked like in the game, but then they score a couple of, at the end and you're thinking, oh, they're going to get back into this game. But um, Adelaide held on. Um, it was, yeah, such a good game. I'm not sure about the, the Sydney FC goal, um, if it was a free kick or not on, on Delia Nolds from, from Patrick yeah. Wood. It's a hard one. Six or one half a dozen of the other, don't they say? It's yeah. like, yeah, I don't know. I, I don't know. Like, you can't I, really I kinda, change it, can you? I kind of like, though, that like, if he hasn't called it, like what we spoke about recently, I think maybe with your penalty, if if you've given the decision and it's not clear and obvious, he's given it a goal, it wasn't clear and obvious yeah. that it was a foul, so don't change your decision. Like, that's fair enough. Yeah. And I think if that gets communicated back as well, then you know what, no problems, but be be consistent with that. But yeah, like you were saying with the press, I'm I'm actually not that we're at Sydney FC. Maybe we'll have to get a guest on from from Sydney soon. But it's um interesting because I feel like Uffi didn't really play like that at, at Wellington. They used to just get yeah. back into their block a lot more, and uh, you know they were very controlled in possession, very controlled defensively, similar to I guess the way Arnie was probably where where Uffi learned under a little bit with with Sydney and, and Corica. Um, so they've obviously changed a little bit, and yeah. the 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 pressing the pressing is working. Like you said, it's I it's, think in this league, that's the way to go. Like I, I know as a player, that's I much prefer to if I lose the ball, win it back straight away under that five seconds, ten seconds, um, and you actually, it's the most dangerous time for the team with the ball. If you just win it back. Players like kind of switch off. You know, you start to spread out. Your fullbacks go a bit high. And midfielders are like, oh, I can relax now. Where if they win it back straight away, you can hurt them straight away. It's like the counter counter press almost of the of losing the ball. Sometimes it, it works better to lose the ball and then win it back, and, and they're almost more open. So I still think they'll be up there. You know, they've got a few injuries at the moment. Rodwell's out. Is it Max out? King's out. Um, so yeah, they're they're looking good. They've got a couple of good young players. They give them minutes too as well. So they they'll they'll make top six, I reckon, and they'll be by the end of the year, if all of them are back and firing, they'll they'll be someone to to kind of look out for because Uffi's got them pretty pretty well organized and they've just got the class, you know, even just in Lolly alone. Yeah. But you add in add in Mac, who two wingers that are really really high quality, Caceres in there, um, Fabio, if he can be scoring some goals. Yeah, they're they're a good team, so we'll we'll see. Um, and then the the last the Sunday, obviously, only speaking about the the men's here. Um, I don't understand why they put these two games at the same time at seven no. five on a yeah yeah. We this is yeah. what we'll speak about next. But yeah. it was great because I could actually watch the games. I was having dinner, went over to Nick Ansel's house. You know, dad life both got the little ones, so just had to, had some food and watch the game but i would have much preferred if one was at 445 and one was 745 yeah. so i could have went yeah. back to back instead i'm watching bondi rescue or something and i don't want to be watching yeah. bondi rescue. i don't know it was it was a bit shit yeah you could only watch one of those games like it's just annoying and, you know well, and they're why? exciting why so i was that? flicking i was flicking between yeah. them at the end and i'm like fuck like i need split screen here um yeah i'll watch and, and, i'll watch um brisbane newcastle but then I was oh, like, did you? obviously the goals were happening. Yeah, the goals were happening earlier in the other game. I was like, Fucking, I'm watching the wrong game here. <laughs> but I stuck with it. And to be fair, both both games were both games were good. Yeah, I changed. I was mainly Perth Wellington, and then second half I kind of changed a little bit to the Brisbane Newcastle just to see. And that's when like there was the two goals. Um, what was it around the 70th minute with uh, Caluccio and then Barbarossa scored again? And I was like, fucking hell! Like in four minutes, I've just missed two goals change it back and then the goal's happening I'm like oh disaster that's why yeah I know. next year they need to do better with that which again uh we'll go into but Perth Glory Sushna what a goal <laughs> I don't know if you saw that fucking hell that, <laughs> that, that that's um that's got to win goal of the week there was a few fucking good goals oh. this week but that was that was next level. yeah Rain that was marketing down big center half just thinks that 
this is i'm taking this one don't worry boys so there was yeah, about what 50 hit. people in the crowd and they were all just yelling shoot and big swoosh yeah, they just hit it you let the center back shoot from there honestly yeah well normally you, you just let them go on it and it either yeah. dribbles along the ground or it goes out into row z but you know what yeah Fair play he's hit it um barbarousis on fire for for the knicks and again like they i think their xg is some of the lowest in the league but obviously they're are they top or equal top or second or whatever they are um yeah, i think they're, they're equal just top, taking, but they're taking their chances um yeah they're they're flying and barbarousis is hitting good form tags is scoring for glory they obviously um need a bit more and on glory interesting one i don't know if you saw our mate ollie bazanic um put yeah. out uh, a story obviously explaining the situation of the intention for him was to, to sign on loan until January and then he was going to stay on till the end of the season but due to the current ownership he wasn't actually able to they're not allowed, able to sign anyone so it's it's a it's a shit show to be honest like imagine if you're Alex yeah. Sajic you know you want to sign players even if you get rid of players you can't sign anyone because obviously of the way that it's it's set up for whatever reason um it's shit for the fans because, you know, they want to be competitive. They want to be fighting. Shit for the players that are there. But also shit for, you know, Oli Bazanic. obviously, is a friend of ours. But, you know, he's got a young family. He's moved over for, the you know, for six months or five months, whatever it was, probably thinking, yeah, then I'll sign on and I'll stay for another six months. Now you're just kind of stuck in the lurch. Do you? Obviously, you go back to West Sydney, but they didn't really want him. So it's kind of just the... It's just a shit one, and, and that's something that in this league, we need to just sort this out. There was the rumors of Newcastle, the owner, an Italian um, buying Newcastle, which if that goes through, that's great. But we need to sort this out because everyone suffers from uh, from shit like this, like just amateur stuff that, you know, I know what happens in all leagues where you know, clubs go into administration or they lose, but it happens too often in the A-League where, you know, they're struggling to, yeah. to make payments or be changing ownership and... It's something if we want the league to grow, you know, you're only as good as your worst worst club probably. If we want these licenses to grow, we want to get the new Auckland team in. If there's another one from Canberra, if that is to happen, great. But you need everyone to be pulling in the right direction. So hopefully, um, yeah, hopefully they can sort that out. And um, and yeah, it's going to be an interesting one for Glory because they've got yeah. no no more reinforcements coming in. So they need the current current players to to keep. Uh, kicking on and, and then over in your Brisbane Jets game um, crazy Stamathopoulos uh, scores against what's that eight for the season finish, man. Yeah. Um, good finish he, great finish he's up on fire it'll be interesting to see um, with the yeah with I guess the club and um, yeah they, they've obviously got this they've come out and said they want to play young players um, it's very evident because you've got players like Jason Hoffman and Cole Jenkinson who you know, in my opinion, should be starting. They've got the quality and the experience to start, but there's obviously a clear direction from from the club, and maybe we need to get uh, Hoffy on, um, a, a, another good friend of ours from back in the day. He's probably a great one to speak to about the situation. Once the ownership stuff yeah. sorted, maybe we can we can get him on. But they, you know, they were pretty pretty harshly done by at the end to you know to lose all three points. But for for Ben Khan, his first win, um, and Brisbane uh, snapping that that losing streak. Yeah, no, nah, he'll be he'll be happy. Ben Carl will be happy just to get the monkey off the back and and get that first win. But um, Newcastle, I think, yeah, would be disappointed because they were in that game, or more than in that game for for a very long period, and then to lose it like that. But I think you got to um, give credit to to Markovsky off the bench because he comes on, he scores the goal, and then he wins the penalty. Look, I don't know whether it's a penalty or not. And this is more of an issue of the actual handball rule itself um, rather than the referees because there's just too much grey area with this handball. Like, you know, uh, uh, Stamatopoulos, he comes out after in the in the um, interview on the ground and says, you know, we got told by the refs at the start of the season, if the ball hits the body first and then the hand, it's not going to be a handball. So I can kind of see it from both sides. I think it's very, very harsh on him. It goes under his body, then hits his hand. Um, but you can also argue if you're a Brisbane player that, you know, if you're not stretching, if you're not sliding like that, then your hands won't be there. So it's, yeah, the rules need to be um, clarified, I think, better. Um, there has to be less yeah. room for grey area, but it's just, I mean, it's too hard right now with this handball rule. Exactly. And um, 
Before we get into our Unite round uh, suggestions, because it is going ahead next year, I've been told. Um, I think it was a three-year deal. So you've had the grand final. You've now had the, the first round of the Unite round. And then next year will be again. We'll just really touch on, obviously, the news. The big news, I guess, is the you know of the week in Australian football was the Socceroos game. They got their first win. Not the best performance, but nobody remembers your first group stage game um, once it comes the the knockout stages. So they got the, the three points. That's all that matters. Um, recover well and get on to the next one. You don't even need to probably review any of that. Just focus on the next game against Syria. Um, but it's exciting. It's good. It's, and the game's all at decent time. So I'm, you know, I hope the, the momentum builds as the tournament starts going on and um, everybody's tuning into it. There's a good chance for us to win some silverware again. Yeah, or well, we obviously stayed up a little bit later um, the other night watching it and we were messaging in the first half saying, what's going on? They're fucking having one. Because <laughs> um, but India were just honestly like sitting in that deep block and just pressing like absolute animals. Like whenever it came into your area, they were just all over us like a rash to be honest. And I think like, I don't know if maybe the Aussies just didn't expect it if we just didn't expect it, like them to be that aggressive, but we were getting into these areas and like just losing the ball pretty easily. Um, mm -hmm. But then, you know what, in, in games like that, as you said, you know, it's not about maybe how you play, um, you know, Irvine gets that goal and then it's like, all right, pressure's off. And then um, in the end, you know, we actually did, we created a few more chances. Even in the first half, we still created chances. They were just defending for their lives. And sometimes yeah. when it's like that, if you don't score after a while, you think, Fuck, is it going to be one of those days where, where we just can't score? But um, they get the job done 2 0. You know, India didn't really have any great chances that maybe the header from the captain in the first half that yeah. goes over Suda's head. I don't know how you that was over that guy's head, but <laughs> apparently it fucking hit the top of the roof as well. <laughs> <laughs> like, honestly, it's, yeah, it was just, it was a top run and a top ball. And if he was just half a meter more forward, Suter and the def and the Italian uh, Italian Indian player, and big uh, the, big Balotelli in the fucking Euros. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but if they were half a meter forward, like, it was a good header down into the ground. It was just that he was out of line of the goals. And if that goes in, like yeah. fuck, that's that changes yeah, everything. Because stations. then they're really oh, it, that would have been scary. But anyway, we don't need to talk about that. Good good win. Harry Kuehl announced as the Yokohama Marinos. The, the Aussie flavor continues on then. Obviously, you've had uh, Boster Coglu into Musket, into Kuehl. So, they obviously like her. And it's a massive, massive opportunity for him going from assistant coach. But before that, he was in you know non-league in England and league two. So, you know, if he does well there, after what Ange has done and now Kevin, like he was linked with some big jobs. You know, Harry goes straight back into the frame of, you know, some some big managerial positions. But... First things first, you need to go there and do well. And, and there's a lot of challenge in, in going to Japan with the language and just the different respect levels, the way you deal with things. So I'm, I'm really interested to see how they go. Um, they're going to be expecting silverware because, you know, the last four or five years they've been challenging and they're and thereabouts. So let's see how he goes. And, and Musket was unveiled um, in China as well. So it's, uh, it's good to see the Aussie coaches kind of getting more opportunities. Hopefully there's even more floating about in the big leagues in Asia or Europe because it's it's better. Um, they just need to bring some Aussie players with them, you know? Sort the players out as well. Give us some give us some big deals. That's what we want. Yeah, look, I think Ange, Ange and Muskie have obviously set the kind of the pathway um, to give these opportunities to, to other Aussie coaches, but they've also set the expectation um, and they've set the bar high. So it'll be interesting to see, to see how Harry does. Obviously, look, we both played with him. Um, his managerial career so far has been probably a bit challenging, but he got the the opportunity, obviously, to go with Ange at Celtic. So I'm sure he's probably come on um, a bit since then and he's probably learned a lot through Ange. So hopefully he does well. Look, you want to see, you know, Aussie managers, players alike um, doing well and getting those bigger jobs. So hopefully he can go there and be successful and see what the future holds for him. Yeah, exactly. But... Now we've got, we've sent it out on the socials. Um, before we get our special guest on um, in, in Tommy Glover, it's probably a good time just, just for a couple of minutes before he um, before he jumps on the pod with us. Um, how how can we improve Unite Round? Because I think the concept is great. Obviously, the grand final decision was reversed into this, so that's maybe had some people already offside. 
there was only, I think, what was it, three or four months to actually prepare for it as well because they announced it in, what, mid mid to late October. We're in January, so you've got October, November, December, three and a half months to organize a big event like this. It's not a lot of time. Yeah. But for next season, you were there, so that helps for starters. Um, but what would you change? If you, if you could change a couple of things, I know we could rattle off a lot of things, but just to keep it kind of a bit shorter... You know, if you had to maybe, let's say, do two or three changes, what would be key things you think you could do to actually improve um, the concept and then get more people to be traveling there from interstate or people from Sydney to actually be going there? Yeah, if I had to say three, I'd say probably timing, scheduling, and maybe incentivizing the fans. Um, giving look I think as well marketing you have to market it it was definitely underdone um, so I think let's get started now let's let's confirm the dates for next season let's make it either the opening round or the second round it's cooler it's not so hot we can have games on you can do games at one o'clock two o'clock if you want really I know it's not really that common in the A-League but but why not Let, let's get the games scheduled at proper times let's not have games at 5.30 on a Friday night because at the end of the day, we were playing MacArthur and most of the people are in Sydney. They're not there on a holiday. So they're working. How, how are you going to get from work? You finish at five o'clock to then you've got to be at Combank Stadium at 5.30 to watch a game. It's just, yeah, that, that sort of scheduling is no good. Having two games on at the same time on a Sunday when there was no other football on. Like spread spread the games out along the weekend. So and incentivize fans, give them give members the people that are the most passionate about our game the ones that are committed to our game and spending the money to to support their team give them an incentive to come and watch a game but also maybe they should get a ticket also for another game of their choosing why don't we try and get people to stay for the whole weekend instead of just you know fly in fly out for for their game so um i think there's a there's a few different things but that that's just quick yeah yeah i think i think that's you you're bang on i think like people miss Garouge scoring the goal because they couldn't get there. And it's ruined it's ruined thousands of people's weekends because they've missed the goal. Exactly. So exactly right. What are we gonna do? APL, you got you gotta answer the hard questions now. Um oh, yeah. but I think yeah, I, I genuinely think round one is the best time to do it. Like I think that's the number one because everybody's got this optimism start of the season you've already got a buzz you're already doing spending money on like a marketing launch to launch the season what better way to launch the season than with the unite round so fly everybody in and this is going to cost a bit more money fly everybody in a couple days before you can actually do all your interviews you can not just interview you know the captains that go for these marketing things you can interview every single player you could be doing a couple of opening training sessions and you know, open it up to NPL clubs to come and actually watch the game, uh, watch the training sessions, or fans if they want to go a day early, they can actually go and watch a training session, have a signing session afterwards. Like that stuff there, I think they they need to do better. That community feel with football is, is what's great. We interact with the fans a lot, so let's try and actually make that better. And round one, no brainer. Um, I agree with the, uh, that. Then the scheduling, like you said. Try and have the girls' games as well, all at the proper stadiums. And, you know, that that's that's better. And and you can have them, like you said, 1 o'clock, 4 o'clock, 7 o'clock. Um, and that way there, you, you get the games done, you know, in, in a shorter space of time, potentially. If there's a long weekend, I don't know if there's a long weekend in October, that would be ideal where you could have it maybe a Friday to Monday, potentially. Um, and then I reckon the only other way to do it is... You don't, yeah, members, you don't want to give free tickets, I guess, because, you know, if it's in Sydney, then, you know, that's the majority of your fans and then they're going to go to the games and not pay. You need some sort of revenue, I guess. But I reckon even getting, having more of a football festival where it's like, have all the junior teams, like have literally from under 12s to under the youth teams, potentially. Most clubs have got academies. If not, send your, your state team and put them in, you know, Adelaide United kits or Western United kits. And like, You've got all these families that are there. They're playing tournaments in the morning. Maybe you're, you know, nine o'clock till twelve o'clock potentially. Um, they're playing some games each day, or they come a couple of days early. However, it works out, and then they're already there. So then they're going to go to the games or play yeah. the NPL teams. Kind of incentivize them in that area to actually come and come and join in and actually watch the games because football's great. We've got football. You've got futsal. You've got beach football. You've got the pararoos. Um, Obviously, all these different things where they will play football. 
So why not just get us there together in something where you can just have like a proper carnival atmosphere and um, then like you said, market it, market it well, get it going. So actually people know about it. Round one's the most basic one because you've already got a marketing budget that's quite big for that. So anyway, that's enough of us uh, jabbering on about it. Um, maybe we can, you know, put our hand up for a job at the APL um, and yeah, try and get some ideas. But um, we'll have to make sure we get more than a couple of double passes to give away for next uh, next season. <laughs> so next next season we'll go for maybe 10, 10 double passes. Um, see how we'll we go a with weekend, that. A whole weekend paid for. That would off. be good. We can, to be fair, if we got that, I'll give it away to myself there. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and Orlando. Oh, and 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 the winner is <laughs> Orlando Mork. You can't go. Oh, I'll yeah. just have to go. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, um, Glover's probably waiting in the other room for us to to be let in here. Um, so he's been good enough to 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 spend some time. So welcoming in on the back of obviously the the controversy that kind of surrounded the APL backflipping on the decision um it's a great time to get him on he's been flying for Middlesbrough played in a in a big win against Chelsea in the league cup played in the was it the FA cup against Aston Villa um so it's a great time to get him in so welcome to to Tommy Glover <laughs> All right, guys, we've got our boy, Tommy Glover. He's here. He's joined us. He's been good enough to, to jump on at night time in the UK. Welcome to the show, Tommy. Thank you for having me. I actually thought I would have been uh, got a bit of an earlier call-up, but uh, we've had to wait uh, to around 13. <laughs> yeah. We, well, we went first with the um, we went first with Socceroos Keepers, so we got Gauchi on. And then, yeah, you just came in after that. Yeah, Gauchi, Bruno, Juki. Yes. Uh, then, then we go to the Oli Roos. So, thank you. Yeah. No, we went to the, then we went like injured soccer players, player. So, we got Borello on. And yeah, yeah. now we're done. Now, now we we'll come to our second tier guests. Yeah. Olympians far out. And Oli Roos. No, nah, it's good. It's good to, um, it's good to have you on. Obviously, you're, you're over there now. You're uh, Matt Barra. You've played in some, some massive games already since you've gone over. Um, and I suppose there's, quite a lot to talk about but we don't want to keep you too long so I suppose we can start first with just tell us a little bit about obviously your journey um you don't need to talk too much about your your junior days because they're probably a bit boring in in Sydney <laughs> but um tell us tell us about you know your time at Spurs obviously when you were a little bit younger and then obviously that that transition after you left um you know you wanted obviously first team football but it wasn't didn't come as maybe as easy as you would have hoped um, after yep. leaving Spurs, but you you eventually you eventually got there. You you got to City and you and you did so well. And now obviously you you moved back over to the UK. So talk to us a little bit about that. Yeah. So kind of I like growing up. I was never really selected in like youth teams, New South Wales, all that stuff. I was supposedly never too good enough. Um, so yeah, I went. I was at Southern Sharks as a kid, tens, elevens, and then went to. Um, they call it Project 22. So it was like a, a football New South Wales Institute where like their project was like for the 2022 World Cup. Clearly didn't work in my sense. So I, I went back to Salado in a... <laughs> <laughs> so that, 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 that fell through. So I went back to Salado <laughs> when I was uh, 14. And then um, it's probably the best thing that ever happened to me, to be honest, because, you know, when you I think you're, and you're a kid, you can get sucked into, you know, going to these sports schools all these top programs but i kind of found out in an early age that you know that was not really the bill and end all was kind of you know play. i went back to Southo to play um and by 14 i was like training with the first team so i gained so much more experience and like training with men at such an early age was kind of you've got to toughen up you know you boys know what it's like when you're a young kid and you train with the men compared to your own age it's, it's a bit different so yeah i went back there and then was doing quite well was playing 18s at the time and then got a tap on the shoulder asking if I'd be interested to go over to um, the UK and obviously I got an English passport which helps um, so yeah went over um, did my trials did, did my time came back and then um, yeah got a scholarship at 15 so was quite young when I moved over and then kind of came through the ranks 
you know, and then ended up training with the first team regularly at 17. And, you know, I did that for maybe two, two to three years. And, you know, it's great training with the first team. And, you know, some of the players that they had was unbelievable. But in terms of personally, you know, I wanted to be playing senior football because you can only play so many reserve games, so many on 23s. And it's, you, you know what it's like. It's not real football. Um, it's like friendlies and, you know, there's, there's points, but it, it, there's no relegation, promotion or anything like that. And that's why I went back to Mariners for a year and that didn't work out for whatever reasons. And, you know, you take lessons out of that being involved in a first team and then went back to Spurs and then was the same, you know, just training with the first team, playing 23s. And that's why I decided to go back to City was just to kind of play regular first team football and kind of use that as a springboard to get back over to Europe, which um, which I'm back now. Was that, um, I guess for you, was, it, was that a tough decision to make to leave? I guess the, you know, being part of Tottenham, it's, it's a big club. You obviously feel comfortable to, to sign a city. I know they're obviously still in Australia in terms of big club, but it's you know, the dream to get to Europe. So to take the step back permanently and sign with City, was that a, a tough decision for you to make at that stage? Yeah, I had a few offers over here, but it was kind of low, like in the lower league. So I had a, a couple of other A-league offers as well, but I don't know, someone, I think it was, Tony Franken or someone was saying that, you know, City is like a ticking time bomb. It's like once they get the right people in there, it's going to explode and it's kind of going to run on and, and which it ended up doing. So, yeah, but then I had on the other hand, so many people telling me if I come back to Australia that I'll never return to Europe. Um, you know, I to be fair, I copped a, a lot of slack for that because a lot of people see the Tottenham badge and the Tottenham tracksuit and they think that's fantastic, which, which it is, don't get me wrong. But, you know, you've also got to put your ego aside and, you know, I had Hugo, Larissa, and Michel Vaughan in front of me. So, realistically, was I going to play for Tottenham the first team? Probably not. <laughs> so, yeah, I think once you put your ego aside and you don't get caught up in all that stuff, you know, and you take a step back, you know, the best thing that I ever did was come back to Melbourne City. Yeah, and obviously, like you said, you had that, that success coming back, which sometimes as a player, you know, you make the decision, but you don't know actually how the club's going to perform. But, you know, you, you, you try and, I guess, make the, the best decision at the time. And, and like you said, there's no point being a number three there or a number four there at Tottenham. And it's not like you're going to win any trophies at Tottenham anyway. So it's best to, to come back to City and <laughs> get a couple of trophies and then yeah. head on back over. <laughs> <laughs> now, then we want a pre-season cup, so that's in the cabinet. No, no one talks about that. <laughs> <laughs> you you were just there at the wrong time. If you were there now with Big Edge, you'd be fighting it out with Vicario for number one. Yeah, I'd probably still be in the same position, to be honest, mate. But all the way he's gone. <laughs> Cheering the boys on from the sidelines. Hey, at least you can cheer on some wins. They're playing some good footy as well. But um, I suppose how um how, how'd like the transition been this time around? Obviously, going back, you you've been in the UK before. You were at Spurs, um. Do you think that's kind of helped you in terms of understanding what it's like going back and, you know, you familiar with the championship? Yeah, I think that that definitely helps. Um, obviously, it's a bit different um, because I was in the first team, but now, like I was in and around at Spurs, you know, I was training every day, but like I wasn't in a men's change. I wasn't in their change room or anything like that. So, but being obviously in England did help me coming back here because I knew what I was kind of getting myself into. Obviously, Middlesbrough is a bit different to London where I was before, but, you know, it helps that, like, Riley um, was already here. I came in with Sammy, um, so we did our medical on the same day. So I think once you've got two other Aussie lads with you, it, it helps so much. And, you know, Riley obviously being there before, it's kind of you, you hang around him for a bit and then, you know, he, he drifts off and you get your own mates. So he is <laughs> as you into it and then you get sick of him. You know what he's like. He's just grumpy all the time. So... You, you, that, that kind of wears off, you know, the national team with him is perfect. Two weeks and you leave him, but I'm actually living next door to him. So, yeah. <laughs> oh, brilliant. Yeah, literally, I could I could touch his wall right now. It's, uh, yeah, we're literally next door to each other. So, yeah, no, he, he's been great. And, yeah, like I said, coming in with Sammy, it's just, it helps so much. Yeah, it's awesome. And I guess going a little bit back then to, to City, um, you had a, a lot of success there. Um, as a group, I guess for you playing those first, obviously after Central Coast, you know, feeling probably like you're part of something, um, winning those championships. What what was it? Do you think that kind of changed? As I think you said, it was Tony Frank and said it's a, it's just waiting to explode. And and obviously when myself and and Ben were there when we were younger, it was the same thing, but they couldn't really get it right. What was it? Do you think that made it? You know, 
all the all the pieces fall into place anyway. I don't I, like. I think when Ben left it, you know, it, it kind of got better, and you know, the, the boys went on a winning streak, and then he, then he, he, he saw the success we had, and he started knocking on the door again. He wanted, he begged to come back. So I got rid of him. But Honestly, I think... I think like the the team, man, the team was unbelievable. You look at the team now. You look at the Socceroos. Like how many Socceroos in that team at one time? I think it was yeah. I think like the like the players wrong, but like you know what it was like in the change room. Like everyone was like brothers. There was no dickheads. There was no cliques and clans. Like you could go speak to anyone in the change room. And I think like that's the best change room that I've ever been a part of. And you know, there's a reason why there's we were so successful. And I think because, and to be fair, like I give credit to Jamo a lot for what he kind of did with the boys and you know the things that we'll do as a team and whatnot. So. You know, if they did, if he did, if like him especially, if he did see anyone not pulling their weight, he'd nip it on the butt straight away. Because like I've been in change rooms where it starts with one player, then next you know five people, and then you know it just turns to absolute shit. So yeah, I think he did a great job of kind of nipping that in the butt. And yeah, everyone was it was just like brothers, and like you'd run, you'd want to run through a brick wall for anyone in your in your team. And I think once you got it right off the pitch, it translates to on the pitch. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, no, it's like you said, Ben, obviously a lot of, I think, talented young players and probably the money that had gone into the club in terms of getting the, the marquees and the big name players. Of course, that's great. And if you can do it, of course, you're going to do it. But probably the investment into the youth when you had, you know, all of those young boys coming through. I know Tilio came across from Sydney, but Connor Metcalf, obviously, you've recruited Aiden O'Neill, a younger player, Natty Atkinson, Jordan Boss, like these players that have kind of come through a little bit more of the academy. Um, they probably also care a little bit more potentially because they mm. actually feel like, you know, I grew up at this club supporting this club. Um, so, you know, you, you probably push each other that little bit further. And I don't know, it was the same for me and Ben when we were younger. If one of you's doing well and the other one's not doing well, because you're so close with each other, you kind of get pissed off that the other one's doing a bit better. So it pushes you to do more. Not that you want to chop him down, but yeah. you want to get even better. And, and I'm sure you guys with the, the young players had that there. And um, yeah, a lot of success came from that time. And, and then you got this... This move, um, which Ben touched on, so how is how has it been settling in? You've now played a few games. You played in some big games recently. Um, yeah. What's yeah? What what's I guess what's the the big thing? Um, I guess that you know you've kind of taken away from your experience in the A League to now be able to play um, at a high level now over there in the Championship. Yeah, I think it's just getting runs on the board. Like like I said, I came back to the A League to kind of get games under my belt, and you know. Uh, who, Matt Nash, who was my goalkeeper coach at um, Mariners, he said, you know, if you do come back, play 50 to 100 A-League games and then go back overseas, you know, you've got to be able to make mistakes. You've got to be able to learn from those lessons that, you know, you can't replicate in training. And I think that was the biggest thing is, like I said, why I came back is to get games to bring that experience back over because, you know, training's great, but, you know, you can't replicate a game. Um, but yeah, obviously the move came across and, you know, it's kind of a similar position to what I was probably in at City um, when I first went to City. You know, I, I didn't start playing until I think around 9, 10, um, so around Christmas time. And it's kind of funny enough happened the same thing here where I was playing the cup games on a cup run. And then, you know, the other goalkeeper who was playing at the time, um, you know, got injured. And then, you know, I've kind of just taken my opportunity and, you know, that's what you kind of work hard. It's, it's frustrating for a goalkeeper because, you know, you obviously can't get subbed on in the 60th minute and play 20, 30 minutes off the bench. So... You know, it's quite easy to kick stones, but, you know, that I've learned in the past, you know, that, that, that achieves nothing. So it's kind of, you just got to train hard for your opportunity and, you know, take it with both hands when you do get it, which I like to think I've done. And, um, you know, we've had some big games. And that's the thing, if you're not ready, if you're not well prepared, you know, you come to these big games, you're going to get found out because you're playing against the best. So, yeah, it's uh, it's been good. It's It's been different in terms of, atmospheres, crowds, and it's just, to be honest, I didn't realise how big Borough was as a club before I got over here and then coming here, it's just, it's it's massive in terms of supporter base and because it's a, it's kind of, that's pretty much the thing that's going on in Middlesbrough, everyone's a Borough fan. So it's, yeah, it's, it, it's, it's been unbelievable so far, but it's just kind of, it's been good so far, but it's just kicking on now. Yeah. Well, we actually, um, we had a question from a, um, we put questions out yesterday. I don't know if you saw on social media, 
And then yeah. someone's replied with this question. Um, it says, at both Melbourne City and now Middlesbrough, you have started as a number two and being able to stay mentally strong enough to keep pushing and then be in the right place mentally to make the most of the opportunity. Is there anything you attribute this to? Or is it just something that has come naturally? And you kind of just answered that, but that question was actually from at Joe Gauchi. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> he wants to know the secrets no, to keep you out of the soccer rows. It's in the book. It's in the book. I, I, don't, <laughs> I don't understand why he hadn't just um, picked up the, the blower and just given you a call or a message, but he's decided to write it on our, on our question box. To be fair, the top question, Joe, but... Um, yeah, maybe just maybe just uh, give Tommy a message. I'm sure you've got his number. But um, I how quite often? often. <laughs> <laughs> and it's oh, a good one. Hey, mate, um, thanks for the question. <laughs> so yeah, you've just answered it, but I suppose how um, how does it mean? Obviously, something like that's completely different over there in Europe compared to probably Australia is the pressure that comes with obviously wearing the jersey. Um, performing and getting results. How have you dealt with the with the pressure so far? Obviously, as you said, you know, Borough have got a, it's a massive club. Like it's a huge club. You know, they've been so successful um, in past times, and obviously now they're in the championship. But they're a massive club. When you look at their name on the on the ladder, you always expect to see them kind of up there in the championship and pushing for that promotion. But how have you kind of dealt with the with the pressure from you know outside noise and fans and things like that? Like for me personally, I just don't get caught up in it. Um, you know, you know, football is like, you know, when you're doing well, everyone loves you. When you're not doing so well, everyone thinks you're the worst player in the world. Um, so it's kind of, I just take all that stuff with a grain of salt. You know, I try not to get too high or get too low. So it's kind of just staying that medium balance. And, you know, I'm going to have people that like me. I'm going to have people that don't like me. So at the end of the day, I've, I've got a tight knit of people who kind of tell me the honest truth. And at the end of the day, I just listen to my coaches and, like, to be honest, I couldn't really care what big Johnny behind the laptop drinking a milkshake thinks of <laughs> what, about my performance, to be quite honest. You know, like, it's not it's not going to affect me. But I know, like, a lot of people, it, it does affect them. Um, you know, like, I don't read comments. I don't, I don't do any of that stuff. But, like, I know it can take a toll and I know it can affect players. And, and I've seen it firsthand. And it's just trying not get caught up when everything's going well, but then it's the opposite when things aren't going so well, not to kind of get too hard on yourself. Yeah, yeah. I think that's that's like a really important thing for all like young players coming through, especially the young ones. Like I'm, I'm sure you both would see it, but like you know, I remember some games you'd, you'd get on the, the the team bus or you're going back to the hotel, and straight away the game's finished, and the young boys are scrolling through the comments yeah. and looking at the comments, like. I just don't like. I don't see any upside to that. Of course, like you said, when you're playing well, you're fucking like, oh, big Johnny thinks I had a good game, and he's, yeah. he's down in his he's down in I'm his the man. milkshake. Yeah. <laughs> um, but but at the same time, like like you said, that what they say actually means fucking not not too much. There's a few fans out there that know what they're talking about. They're passionate. They're it's like me when I watch Arsenal. I'm fucking saying how shit soccer is some games, but fucking hell, I couldn't even tie his laces up. So who am I to tell him <laughs> on on Twitter or Facebook how well he's doing? Um, yeah. so it's important it's important not to, to read into it because yeah you can fucking go down a rabbit hole and if you do get down it's very hard to get out of that and imagine that you you finish your career and you think fucking hell I got you know the trolls the trolls got over me different story when the whole stadium's bo- booing you like um, Maguire potentially or, or Glover against victory or Glover against victory <laughs> after the, the bucket man's fucking <laughs> launched to that yeah like yeah. I think that that's but that's that's a different one as well when they're booing you for something like that um, but <laughs> yeah. while, while we're on it we might as well go into that so what um, <laughs> we weren't even going to bring it up it's not even in our questions but what what was that whole experience like obviously when you've just got fucking 5,000 people just charging at you <laughs> and the rest and the- <laughs> What, what what was actually going through your head at that moment, or did you not even have time to think? It's yeah, that's something that will happen once in a hundred years. But yeah, if, you don't expect those. Obviously, kind of, obviously all the protest and all that happened. Obviously, the games before on the twenty second minute mark, and obviously the flares coming on the pitch and whatnot. But you know, I can say it on record. You know, it was never my intention to throw it back into the crowd. You know, once I saw that thing in my hand, I was like, oh my god, surely not. Um, and then obviously they, they storm the pitch, but you know, if, even with that, you know, I've always said, I've said it the day after it happens, you know, it's, 
there's there was twenty five thousand people. How how many were there? It takes one person to to ruin it. You know what I mean? Yeah, they stormed the pitch, but one person threw the bucket, and you know he kind of brings everyone else down with them. And you know, victory have the best fans in the A League week in week out. It's it's unbelievable, and you know that's what you want to see at A League games. And for like for one incident like that to kind of diminish and kind of bring everything down after, especially what happened with the Socceroos as well. You know, that was only a few weeks after what happened. It was kind of, yeah, whatever happened to my head happened, that's going to heal. But, you know, it's the other stuff in terms of the league and, and stuff like that, which kind of its name got, you know, dragged through the ringer a bit, which was kind of the hardest bit. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. That was, that was like one in... You'll never see anything like that. I remember I was I was actually out at dinner. I think I was I had a birthday and like I was like oh, the derby's on. I have to watch it. And me and my brother-in-law were watching it, and like this kind of stuff has just like started happening. And I've like called my brother-in-law. He's sitting on the other side. Come on, get coming in quickly. And like as this kind of happened, like you just see you get pegged with this bucket, and like my <laughs> missus has come like running over from the other side. She's like, fuck, like. Oh fuck! Like I got a message, Lex. Like, what? What's Lex gonna be thinking? Like, obviously your partner. And then yeah, yeah like I remember she was messaging her, like, and she was going crazy as well. Like, fuck, what a what a that will never never ever happen again. It's like kind of when um when Grealish got punched by that fan. It's like yeah, that shit will happen like one, once in a lifetime. Like, when do you expect to go out into a football field and leave in an ambulance going to a hospital because someone's thrown a, a sand bucket at you? So- it was actually funny. She will absolutely hate me for saying this. So before that game, she went out with a few of the girls and, and they, were, they were having a few drinks. So when obviously this happened, she, I think she was a bit tipsy. And then um, obviously she couldn't drive me to the hospital because she'd had a few drinks. So I had to get, <laughs> I had to get, uh, Anthony McCurry had to come, uh, come with me. So she, he, he was sitting with me the whole time. Oh, yeah, oh. she'll absolutely. I'll be in the doghouse now for that saying that. But uh, yeah, that's what happened. She says she's never drinking a football games again. Oh, that's <laughs> tall. Oh, that's tall. crazy. Yeah, it's that. Yeah, not like you touched on. It's is just a completely. It was a shit show. Just not just for that immediate. Obviously, your your face is recovered. But to be honest, a few extra scars on your face. You're not looking the best anyway. So it doesn't matter too much. It's hard being a ten out of ten, mate. <laughs> <laughs> So anyway, we'll move on. We'll move on from the bucket man. I actually think he's just appealed his his, his jail charge. I'm pretty sure it came up on my news feed yesterday. So maybe yeah, you need to have a word. You need to have a word and say fucking put him back in there. He's a danger. He's got a, <laughs> he's got a fucking great arm on him. What are the chances? Honestly, it hits you in the head. <laughs> hey, fair, hey, I oh know, I know. Literally, he was about five meters away. Like fair play, he Shot got me. Just fucking no. dang. That's <laughs> uh, fucking uh-huh. too good. Anyway, on to the serious stuff. We've got we've got a couple of questions we've prepared, and then we've got some other fans that have that have sent in some stuff. But probably something that's pretty exciting. Um, well, what I want to find out is what's it been like under under Michael Carrick. He's, he's obviously was a top player. The way he wants to try and play football, from what I'm reading on Twitter from Johnny and his milkshakes, is he wants to play good <laughs> style. <laughs> Um, and it's an exciting style. So I haven't watched too many games. Um, so if you can fill us in on on how he is. And in Japan, they don't, they don't fucking, they don't put the championship on. There's no, there's no Japanese players there. Dude, you've been yeah, in Australia is. for there's the a last few. three there's, Is there? <laughs> yeah, there's a few, Jack. Yeah. Coventry, <laughs> Huddersfield. Yeah. No, fucking hell. They don't care about them, do they? <laughs> yeah, no. yeah, they're not the national team. Don't care about them. Uh, yeah, he's, um, yeah, he, he's class, um, to be honest. And it's purely, he just purely wants to play football, um, there's so much tactics. Uh, so we play four at the back, two holding midfields, three, and then one up top. Um, but the left winger usually drifts inside to make like a double ten. Um, but yeah, just so much detail that goes behind it. Even like goal kicks, like our goal kicks. There's it's like there's set plays, there's traps. It's kind of when the fullbacks are low, space in the middle. When the fullbacks are high, you create a three v two around the box. So. There's so much detail and thought that gets put in behind. Like he just doesn't put a session on for the sake of it. Every day has a purpose, and you know, every, you know, like sometimes you can get coaches where you know what you're going to do every single week. Monday is going to be this. Tuesday is a tough session. Wednesday, like it's 
and like even like days off I, I thought oh well, we might have some days off you know we get one day off a week thursday like the equivalent of just say a wednesday in australia would be a day off well that's what i'm used to but thursday is like a down day where you come in you do recovery and you watch video and you watch video about like the opposition team so even that i i think that's maybe a man united thing that he's kind of brought across um but yeah just it's details 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 obviously there's the other side of it where you know he wants you to be killers in the sense of like run everyone over and that but you know when you got the ball it's there's a purpose in what we do and and going forward and even defensively as well no yeah, well yeah that's, that's um well. Yeah, that's quality. I guess, you know, like it's it's interesting, isn't it, where you've got like players, you know, he played at the top level. He was an unbelievable player, but probably mm. because he was a technical player and he had to be a smart player compared to other players that just played off instinct, he probably learned a lot more about the game. So this has helped him in his career. Because then you look at, I'm not saying that I've had Wayne Rooney or, you know, some of these other big players like, you know, Lampard and Gerrard, they become managers and mm. maybe they, they struggle a bit more because they're all on instinct, where Carrick was obviously completely the the other side of it in, in terms of the details um how would you compare him to other coaches you've had in australia i know obviously uh the paddy kisnorbo was was really big on the tactics and that would you say i'm not you don't have to say one's better than the other but would who's, you say you know, goal in terms of the detail it's it's that next level yeah i, I think yeah obviously paddy was big on like details and stuff like that but i think this is probably like another level where it's kind of it's that on on steroids really it's but in, in that sense we don't really like we won't work on like with pk and our sessions there we'll work on our goal kicks just say like start of the week as opposed to here we don't really go through tactics maybe a day before the game we will go like maybe you'll pull the starting 11 and they'll just do like a shape to themselves um but it's not kind of 11 v 11 all right work on goal kicks stuff like that they kind of implement drills where it's kind of you just play but there's like a purpose behind it which will involve goal kicks or or stuff like that or playing through the middle um but it's not really a, a goal kick day or a, you know you know what i mean man like you know with like yeah. city hours like kind of yeah tuesday be built up two kind of day it's not really like that yeah yeah but to be honest you don't really have time to train like you hardly train here because like after over the christmas period we played 16th, 19th, 23rd, 26th, 29th, 1st. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. I'm crazy. So, like, it's when not, you have three-day turnaround, recovering. you have, yeah, day off. The second session will be a start-up session, and then day before a game is a match day minus one. So, that's kind of possession. And then the starting 11 might do set pieces by themselves, but that's just kind of a walkthrough, and then you're playing again. Yeah, wow. Yeah. So, it's... Obviously, I guess that's probably why they do a bit of the video on the days off. And um, I think that's probably something that football's just like getting more and more detailed. Like you see all these plays. It's kind of like probably taking things from like a basketball where it's like the set plays. And um, yeah. I think it's good. It's It makes it exciting. But, you know, at the end of the day, you can have the best tactics in the world if you don't have players that want to run through that brick wall for, it for you. Fucking mean yeah, it means nothing. nothing. Yeah, literally. So, <laughs> literally um, means nothing. So that that's that interesting, interesting to hear. I might have to try and tune into a few games and uh, and learn a thing or two. Um, you watch Ben, don't you? Yeah, I'll watch him. I'll he, watch him all. He, <laughs> he said how uh, big I'll, the club was before. How many? What? What have they won? What have they won? And what have they done? Come yeah, on. go on, Ben, buddy. Oh, mate, you, what do you mean? Your what's the hi what's the history of Middlesbrough? <laughs> Anyway, guys, I actually got to run. Yeah. <laughs> you said you're training at midday, mate. It's eight thirty. Yeah. Well, what do you mean? They were, when I was younger, they were they were in the print. So that's a big club yeah. in my in my so, eyes. Like when I when I think back to like all those years, and you see that these clubs were in the Premier League. Like that's a team that I knew when I was a young kid. Obviously, I didn't know too many teams. I knew the big team because that's why I followed. But Teams like Leeds and things like that. Like your young kids these days, if you say Middlesbrough, they don't know Middlesbrough. They're not going to be like, oh yeah, Middlesbrough, that's right. So, I don't know. But I'm just, I'm joking. just, still, We're just I'm, joking around. I'm just still having a chuckle about the set plays because I remember that when we were at City and I just remember this one day, PK, we, we remember how he used to do these goal kicks, like some, some rogue goal kicks. And I remember I was playing right back at the start of the season. You had to like pass it to me. And I had to hit this like diag to the other side of the field on my right foot, like first time. 
And I just remember, I couldn't fucking do it. I fucked it up like five times. And I remember you, you're just like passing the ball out to me. Oh, come on, get it right. And I honestly just couldn't do it. So hopefully, uh, Michael Carey's got a better right back than me over there. I'm sure he does. <laughs> I was just um, having a little bit of a chuckle when you were talking about your goal kick. But, um, <laughs> let's um let's let's go in with another question. Fuck, you know, I feel like I'm getting peppered. Um, <laughs> who's who? Obviously, you played in a few big games recently. You played against Villa, um, and Chelsea. Obviously, you've got the return leg for Chelsea, so hopefully, you can do them at the brief. But um, who's the best player you've seen um or you've played against since you've been over there? Like back to being obviously the the games against the Premier League opposition or even a Championship player. Oh. I don't like, really is know. Is there in anyone in the Chelsea Chelsea game where you were like, fuck, like, you know, you watch this guy and he's a gun, but fuck, now I'm playing against him and like, he's just unbelievable. I know they're not doing no. that well at the moment. Yeah, I think, like, you know, it's like you, you try not to get, like, starstruck. Like, well, I grew up watching, like, Raheem Sterling, for example, and Thiago Silva. Um, but, like, the difference between, like, the Chelsea game and the Villa game, well, we obviously played Villa before them. Villa are probably more of like a team. They're like a, a good team, and they're like they're well drilled, as opposed to like Chelsea's a bit more like off the cuff, where it's like they've got the indiv- they've got the individuals to hurt you, like Sterling, Palmer, and you know that they've signed on everyone. Um, but to be honest, the, the the difference, the speed, it's just a different level, man. Like I remember, it was like the first five minutes of the game, and the centre back was kind of holding the ball, and then he he kind of threw the old grenade uh, to me. I took a touch. Next thing you know, man, I see this guy easily like. A meter away, like far out, man. Like it's just that so much quicker. It's like they're always like one step ahead. Even like not to, nothing to do with me. Like up the pitch, you know. It's like they read every pass. It's they're just yeah. so switched on and just everyone's physically just beast, man. It's the huge. I think it's crazy, yeah. like because we can all press the same way because we're all just humans at the end of the day. Like just because they're yeah. better players doesn't mean they should be better at pressing, but. That's what I've always found as well when you play like at a high level, you know, when at hearts when we played against Premier League teams in preseason and stuff, like the way these guys press, you don't have a second on the ball. And yeah, then, I know. Like when you said, like when you've got the ball, you go for a pass, you think it's on, you think like, oh yeah, I'll make that pass. And then like you look up and they've just read it. It's you like they knew you were going to do that all along. Yeah. And it's like, fuck, how are these guys like there? They're like the best <laughs> players technically and like their decision making, but then without the ball, they're the best at mm. pressing. They're the best at, you know, intercepting, reading the game. Like, it's just, you feel like a bit helpless. <laughs> yeah, I know. But to be honest, I, I'm so, actually glad that happened. It was because obviously we played the two games. That was the first five minutes of the first game. So it's like, all right, I, I can't probably stay. So I've got to give myself an extra five yards to kind of, I, I've got to take an extra touch, give myself that extra time yeah. just to kind of not get closed down. So it's probably the best thing that did happen. But yeah, they're just they're just one step ahead. It's so much quicker. It's so much more physical. And like I said, they're just so they're so much smarter. But at the end of the day, where it's eleven humans against eleven humans, it's not like they're robots. Lord. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I think we'll just um for the last question, we'll just say Maddie Cash anyway. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Put one past me, so. Or Roberto Carlos. <laughs> yeah, I think um. I think one of the big things is obviously is that, like you said, the physicality, like, cause they're just all big, they're all strong, they're all quick. Like that's obviously technically they need to be good, but you know, they're, they're the, the top of the top, you know, like if you do yeah. the physical testing stuff, they probably are, they're the best. And Chelsea, obviously even at higher level up, um, compared to other teams, but it's an unbelievable experience for you. And, and hopefully you can, um, get it done in the second league. I've got to figure out where to watch it. I don't even know where, um, where it's on in Australia. Maybe be I'm pretty sure. Be in sorts. Yeah. Yeah, so fucking just another thing I need to subscribe to. Thanks, uh, thanks, Tommy. Maybe you can hook me up with some like a Middlesbrough fucking all access or something. Just get a dodgy stick, mate. With TV. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but we've got one more. We've got a couple more questions. This one is from anonymous. Why is his nickname Mudders? <laughs> oh, I know. <laughs> I know this is from. <laughs> There's... Where did you get this question from? This isn't on our run sheet. <laughs> this was slid into the DMs. This would be from a certain Melbourne City player. Correct? It is from a Melbourne City player. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. 
very wealthy man, this man. Um, yeah, so there's a, there's a running joke with me and this individual about, uh, well, this individual's got very high skin folds and uh, I call him mud guts. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so his nick, uh, my nickname to him was Mudders, meaning mud guts. Um, and then he calls me mud guts. I don't know why. Um, he, he always asks me if my gym pro. He always asks me my gym program. Um, so yeah, that's why it's it's come from me calling him that. But then I think he's just deflecting it back on me, calling me yeah. mud guts. Okay, so he's actually <laughs> he's put it he's put the spotlight on himself. Yeah, big time. Yeah, he's out of himself. <laughs> I'll I'll I'll, I'll mutter McLaren. <laughs> M M M and M's. I'm gonna I'm gonna start calling him M and M's. Yeah. <laughs> You know what? He can have the mud guts because he keeps fucking quality. scoring. Yeah, exactly, he mate. Yeah, exactly. Well, so he can he can enjoy he can enjoy he himself. Wants, so mate. we'll have I'll to get him on. We'll have to get him on so he can uh, so he can speak back to that. But um, go on, Ben. You can answer. We'll go with two more. We don't want to keep him too did long. Ma- he needs to get his beauty sleep. Did Mac send that to you? Did Mac send that to your <laughs> questions on on Insta? Yeah, <laughs> that's top. Um, we'll go one from um at Beachy fourteen. Which is a big Vichy, big SA boy, keeper himself. Um, biggest goalkeeping influence? Uh, as a kid? Yeah, I suppose growing up or someone that you maybe watch now that you, you take maybe lessons you from. Emulate. Maybe maybe you look at Joe Gauchi's game now and just see how you can get better than him. Yeah. Get into the soccer roos. Yeah. <laughs> I'm gonna send him a few. I'm going to, next time he's on, I'll send him a few questions. So I can get the answers. Hey, that, that's the difference. When when he was on the show, you didn't send any questions through. He's always trying to learn. I know. I know. That's why I got this. I got this, this book, mate. I have got to write my things down. Um, I think as a kid, oh, obviously you got like the, the likes of Swartz, but I think it probably goes a bit for like deeper than that in terms of like when I was at Sutherland Sharks, I always looked up to the first grade goalkeeper coach. Uh, Nathan Denham, um, and to be honest, he's, um, I'm the God's, uh, godfather of his son, um, so it's small world. Oh, but yeah, I think as a kid uh, growing up, I looked up to him. I always wanted to play for Southern first team. I always wanted to have, because he was in and around like A-League setups and as well, so I kind of always looked up to him um, and wanted to be a goalkeeper. And then obviously when I got past the Southern Sharks phase, it's kind of, um, you know, Casillas was a massive one back in the day. Um, that I always watch like YouTube and uh, Buffon was a massive one as well. Yeah, some some top players. That's pretty cool, I guess, like for, you know, for you as a junior player. And I think that's like a really big thing that probably needs to needs to happen more in terms of, you know, you're playing NPL, you know, the young players should look up to the first team players there. And then if, you know, same within the A-League setups, so during the academies, you should look up to the players. I know we're not, you know, we're not fucking playing for Arsenal. We're not playing for Chelsea. We're not at the top level. But as a kid, you know, you're influenced by the people that you can kind of see and talk to. And, um, you know, that's awesome that, you know, you've obviously got that relationship with him still and, and being the God um, parent to his son. Um, so we'll go on to the next question. And this one is from Akito underscore Natsu. Tommy, what are some things you've seen playing over there that you'd recommend A-League teams to take on board to help develop more talent to be able to play in Europe or take the next or take a, the A-League to the next level? I think it just comes back to the opportunities you get as youth. Like I look at the training ground now, like when you leave in the evenings, there's like under eights, there's, there's every single age group. And even on like weekends, you know, there's kids playing games. And I think that's probably one thing about Australia that lacks is, you know, you've got your MPL, but, you know, other than that, if you're not in the A-League, there's nothing else. Um, you obviously know what it's like over here. There's so many leagues you could think of. So there's always, opp- I think opportunity is the biggest one. You know, if you, if you just say a young kid doesn't make it at Middlesbrough, he can go try somewhere else. And, yeah. you know, he just doesn't give up. And, you know, even like when I was a kid growing up in, I don't know what it's like where you guys are from, but we had to pay rego fees. Um, and the rego fees in Australia are absolutely or in Sydney, are ridiculous. Like two and a half, three thousand dollars a kid um, just to play for an MPL team. So, like people who just say can't afford that, you know, are you stopping a young kid from, you know, potentially the next soccer, the next kid to go overseas, you know, just because they can't pay rego fees. So, I think little things like that kind of add up, and it's the biggest thing is opportunity. But in terms of like being over here compared to the A League, I think 
I think playing in front of like a massive crowd every like we get twenty seven thousand every week, like obviously depending on um, how many like the away fans. But even like when we got an away game, we'll always bring four, three or four thousand, even if it's in Plymouth, which is a six hour drive. Like it's, uh, it, but you're also not competing with other sports, so I, I understand that. Um, but yeah, I think it's it, the crowd and the environment, and yeah, I think like bringing it back to the youth is just opportunity. Yeah, yeah, yeah I think the well, um, pathway, the pathway, is something that needs obviously a lot of work. That's kind of something that we've already spoken about, and we probably still will go deeper into it in future episodes, but. Yeah, the pathway is probably the, the biggest difference and it just shows where the game's at, you know, in England compared to Australia and it's just it's chalk and cheese. You can't even compare the two, but um, yeah. no, I completely agree. But um, should we leave him there, Steph? Leave him there because I've uh, I've got to get to my session soon as well. So <laughs> we'll, uh, we'll, let, we'll let the big I wanna, man I go. Wanna, I want to dance some more. <laughs> we'll have to get you on for a part, no, part two, <laughs> mate. Maybe you and yeah, you and two. Joe Gauchi can come on together. Yeah, no worries. <laughs> we'll get Maddie on as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah sounds oh, good. That'd be all right. I wouldn't mind getting Maddie Ryan on. I think he'd come on. No, that's um, that's top. You know, appreciate you you coming on. Second uh, best keeper that we've ever had on this podcast. We really uh, appreciate it. But um, nah, it's uh. It's uh, honestly for me, uh, it's unreal to see you doing so well now over there and, and playing for such a big club like Middlesbrough. <laughs> so, um, rich history. Nah, really happy for you, mate. I think, um, I think if you keep going and, and you keep playing, you, you'll be back in that soccer squad soon. And, um, wish you all the best for the for the rest of the season. And I'm sure I'll keep in touch with you. But, um, thanks a lot for coming on. Pleasure, boys. Thank you for having me. Yes, mate. Football Friends with Ben and Steph is proudly brought to you by the Inner Game Journals, started by none other than our co-host, Stefan Moore. The Athlete Performance Journals were created to help athletes of all abilities become more self-aware through goal setting and reflection. On or off the field, the mental side of the game is so crucial to help you feel and perform at your best. Head over to www.theinnergamejournals.com and use code FOOTBALLFRIENDS to get 15% of all products. If you're a club, school or a Academy, you're in luck. Stefan also runs workshops and he's just released the app version, which will allow you to give direct feedback to players. Download the app for free today. Search the inner game on the App Store. Another uh, top chat with Tommy Glover. Another great guest to have on. It was um, a, good, a good story, I suppose. A little bit different to maybe some of the guests we've had before. He's been overseas, came back. Um, did the business at Melbourne City and now uh, he's got his chance to go back over and he's he's doing well. So it was good to good to have him on. Yeah, exactly. I think he's probably um extremely well known um for maybe the, the wrong reason with, with some people. Um but you can see in this chat, you know, people people say things about him because of that incident and, and like he said, it was a complete complete accident to throw it back in and there's no no blame on him whatsoever. But you know, he's a good guy. He's a he's a hardworking person. He's is a is a funny guy. Um, and you know what? You don't get back overseas if you don't have that um, that resilience or that that mentality to to keep on wanting to improve. And um, it's very easy to come back to Australia and and stay here. Um, but he he's obviously ambitious. He wanted to get back over there. Um, I loved hearing about how he said you know someone he looks up to was the the goalkeeper at Sutherland Sharks. I think it was. Um, you know these these people, whether it's coaches or you know administrators in the the NPL and the junior levels, they can have such an impact on on young players. Um, and obviously he has with Tommy and um, yeah that that was pretty pretty cool to hear. And I'm really yeah I'm excited to tune into a few more uh, Middlesbrough games and especially the the second round of the cup. You know I might have to buy the subscription for for one week. And um, just so we can watch him. Um, and if he makes any good saves, then we'll have to send those clips over to Joe Gauchy as well so he can watch him and, and get some study in. I'm sure Joey will be, uh, will be watching closely as well. But now don't be a tight ass. Just buy the, um, just buy the subscription instead. It's not that hard. But um, I suppose on that note, we'll, we'll close out the episode. It's been a, um, another good one. Um, as always, guys, 
make sure you're following our socials we're at football friends pod on insta and tiktok at ben and steph pod on x and football friends with ben and steph on youtube if you'd like to watch us and see us as well uh, it's a good one to kind of to see the episode with tommy as well because we had a good laugh there so um thank you guys for tuning in for another ep we'll see you next week as always thank you thanks guys have a great week Oh, friend. Fuck you lot, where's the beer?